There you go. Oh. Good boy. Hey folks, Augie and Brittany here, and our fluffiest bush dog, Yuki. Uh, today we are going to be talking about habitat, so thanks for joining us. hanging out in the bush of Frontenac County, Southern Ontario, on a dead beach, decomposing beach, part of the habitat. Indeed. And in thinking about habitats, we were remembering something that somebody had told us once about how long ago, back before Europeans came to this land. When this uh, area was inhabited by mostly Algonquin people. Indeed. Uh, a squirrel could go all the way from what's now called Ottawa to what's now called Toronto without ever touching the ground. So that would be like hopping from tree to tree. To tree, 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 and then another tree, and then you know what? Another tree. Yeah. And even another tree. And so basically, on and on, lots of trees. Well, and what do we call it when when there's lots and lots and lots of trees? Anybody? Anybody? A forest. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. And the crowd goes wild for the forest. Southern and southeastern Ontario for a really, 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 really long time. This whole area of Ontario was mostly forest. And if you go out in the car today, um, as you're driving through, even if you go through the country roads, you're going to see some forest, but what else are you going to see? Well, you're going to see lots and lots and lots of open farm fields. And then you might pass a few houses and even eventually some subdivisions. And then as you get into the city, well, you're going to see even less and less trees. If you think about where um, plants and animals like to live, well, they need, they need homes, they need water, they need shelter, they need food, they need all sorts of things that nature can provide. And in a concrete jungle like a lot of us live in in the city, well, you just don't have that amount of diversity of life. Now, we'll get back to this concept at the end because there is some things we can do to encourage more life. I would also like to just point out that compared to many other cities that I've seen, we have it pretty good in Ontario in terms That's of true. wildlife like it, it could be a lot worse so we have That's to true. really take care of that as much as we can I think we've been doing a good job but we, we can improve we got to keep doing it and so if you if you look at the forest that we're in right now you know it might seem really old to you right um, but believe it or not it's only been here for about 100 years yeah that's, that's right pretty young <laughs> it's that's pretty young for a forest hmm. this is what has been allowed to grow back in about 100 years pretty impressive i mean, I mean wow it's doing a really good job of growing back right lots of biodiversity besides a few very large trees that were left standing this whole forest was cut right to the ground so what was here before this forest cows what were the cows doing here? Eating. Yeah, people were raising cows here, believe it or not. Uh, we actually found some old cow bones in the forest just over there. I don't know if we can find them to show you today, but um, yeah, really, really fascinating. People, um, you know, where, where a lot of humans go, we have a tendency of cutting down forests so that we can grow or raise more food. But of course, that that's a thing for sure. That destroys a lot of ecosystems too, and there's ways we can do it better, and we'll talk about that later. And so, of course, this forest didn't just grow up overnight. You know, it took a really it took all of about a hundred years to get to the stage it's at. There's this concept called ecological succession. And what Oof. that means is complicated. <laughs> what that means is um, nature goes through a series of stages, like in life order, stages, in order to get to where it's going to go. And so, um, we actually asked our friend Katie, uh, who's out at Stillwater Stables today, to go out to our old camp and and check things out there for you because she is um, in a really good position out there today to be able to show you what the early stages of a forest look like. And so Katie's now going to give you folks the virtual tour. Katie, take it away. 
Hey guys, I'm Katie and I'm here at beautiful Stillwater Stables in the back land here. Um, this is where Britt and Augie used to do their camps for Nature Connections. Uh, it's where I do some of my programs for Willow Tree and we're so excited to have our first virtual field trip here. Um, and we're really excited to start hosting more people in the coming school year for field trips and groups and just people coming to uh, appreciate this beautiful land that we have. What's really interesting about this field, this space over here, is that not very long ago it was uh, a farm field. So it was really, there was nothing growing here other than crops, nothing naturally occurring growing here. Um, so it actually looked a lot like this field over here. And you'll see that, that there is a lot of greenery there, but it's all planted by seed and it's not, uh, there's nothing um, native to this area that's growing in that field. Um, and so just in the last 15 years or so, this area has actually been reforested. So you can see how much can happen uh, in a relatively short amount of time. What's really cool about habitats is that where different habitats meet each other are called habitat edges, and that's where we can find the most diversity of life. So here we're on the edge between a pond, a pond habitat, and a grassland habitat. And so there, are, there is life living in the grassland part, and there is a lot of life living in the pond, but we actually find the most life living here along the edge where they meet. So we're here along the edge right now, and we've already seen uh, some little baby frogs hopping around. Uh, and we see a lot of really diverse plant life. Um, and if you look over there on that edge, you can actually see a muskrat house. And what's cool about muskrats is that they eat cattails and they, so you'll find muskrats living in water because cattails only grow where there's water. You can see the reforestation that started to happen in this area. Uh, part of it has been helped by humans, Brittany and Augie and some of their students planted a lot of trees out here. Um, but also what the forest has done by itself. Uh, you can see that the wind comes from that way, which is the west. It most often comes from the west. And if you even look up at that big white pine over there, you can see that it tells you which way the wind most often blows by the way that it's curving. Um, and what's really neat is if you look behind us, you'll notice that there's a lot more trees and life and shrubs growing over there. And that's because that west wind brings seeds in from, from that end and where the, where the forest has been for a really long time. And they haven't actually quite reached this far yet as often. Um, so you can actually see like the wind blowing seeds this way and the growth coming this way with it. So I'm standing in front of a buckthorn bush here, um, and buckthorn is actually a, considered an invasive species here in Ontario, and uh, so usually that's, that's not something that we want, but, uh, but buckthorn can actually long term in a forest be really helpful, uh, because what happens is in, in somewhere that has been um, taken over by grass, like you can see has happened here, there's a lot of grass and low-lying uh, wild plants. Uh, trees have a really hard time competing with grass to sprout up. So when tree seeds land, they have a really hard time uh, get, sprouting and germinating because they actually compete with the grass for uh, soil, like soil nutrients and water and all the things that they need to, to grow and live. Uh, but buckthorn is actually really good at competing and they often sprout through the grass. And then what happens is that they provide a lot of shade underneath, which grass doesn't like. And so uh, the grass thins out underneath them and eventually uh, dies off. And then the trees, the good trees that we want, the trees that will provide a nice forest, can actually um, have a better chance to germinate and sprout and grow. So here we actually have a really good example of a tree that was able to grow underneath some buckthorn shrubs. Um, so, like we said before, trees and uh, grass are actually enemies. They actually really compete for uh, nutrients and water and soil. Um, 
but uh, grass doesn't really grow well under in shade and trees can handle a little bit of shade especially when they're very young so this, this tree was able to find a spot underneath these buckthorn shrubs uh, to grow and you can see that it's actually outgrown the buckthorn now and what will eventually happen in the lo really long-term reforestation process is that uh, these trees will be so big and provide so much shade that the buckthorns will eventually not have enough uh, enough light and they will start to die off. So we hope you guys enjoyed this virtual field trip all about habitats. Thank you so much to Katie for showing us around the backfield and for making this possible. You know what was really cool? That muskrat lodge is still there. It was really cool throughout the years getting to see as the forest started growing up through the grass and um, and the more wild and natural the area became to be able to see how many cool animals started coming around if you were just quiet enough and patient enough to listen. You know what we should do? We should dig up those uh, trail camera video files. Oh, I forgot about those. See. Yeah, we should oh, put those on there. Yeah, definitely. okay, guys. You're gonna like this. Check you will this out. love, you will love, love, love. show you how how much nature can really take care of itself if we can just you know let it do its thing and let it regrow